Father God, uh, thank you so much that you are active in the world, and thank you for Eric's report, and we pray for the missionaries that uh, he has mentioned and the work that he has mentioned, that you will go before them, that you will watch over them, that you would cause the growth of your people uh, spiritually as well as physically with buildings and programs. We thank you that uh, we can trust you. Thank you that you are a God who is living and that you know our every need and you see our every heart. We thank you that you're a God of reconciliation. And so as we look at reconciliation today, uh, speak to us and may we be encouraged. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we're in the book of Genesis and Genesis we're looking at some key characters and one of them of course is Jacob and um, his brother, twin brother Esau. And today we're in Genesis um, chapter thir uh, 33. And um, we, the topic today is reconciliation. So let's define reconciliation. What is reconciliation? I'm going to talk a little bit about reconciliation, and then we're going to get into the chapter itself, and then we'll have um, some takeaway lessons that we can, we can go away with to further contemplate. So to uh, reconcile means to bring together, okay? To reconcile is bring together, and there will be a change of a relationship. And this change of relationship is between normally between two parties, right? So you reconcile between two parties, and it is from a, a stage of uh, hostility and rebellion to um, a change for, toward the state of harmony and peace. So reconciliation is coming together, coming together from a state of hostility and rebellion and fighting to a state of harmony and peace. And so that is what reconciliation is. And in our chapter, we have twin brothers. We have Esau and uh, we have uh, Jacob, and they will be reconciled. And that'll be the end of their kind of story uh, as we move on further in Genesis. Reconciliation is God's plan. Okay, This is what he wants us to do. And when we look at reconciliation, we have to also recognize that sin, on our next slide, sin is the rebellion or a defection from God's um, command or God's character. So sin is a rebellion against God's commands. When God says you are to love your neighbor and so on, and you say, no, I'm not going to. God says you're, you're going to forgive, and I say I'm not going to. You're rebelling against his commands. When he says, do not forsake the assembling of one another, and you decide you're not going to go to church, you can do church on your own, in your backyard with nature, you're rebelling against God's command. And we also defect from his character, because he is a holy God, he wants us to be holy. So we're not always what we need to be, so we are a defection. We, we tend to go uh, the wrong way, our tendency is to sin. So sin is a rebellion, a defection from God's character and God's command. And this is the reason why God wants to reconcile us. He brings us back to himself. So reconciliation and, in fact, the whole Bible, you can say that sinful man um, from a relationship of rebellion, that God is bringing sinful man from a relationship of rebellion and disharmony to God, back to himself, okay, to a relationship, a status of peace and harmony, again, uh, with God. So God is at work today. God is reconciling the world to himself. We see that in 2 Corinthians 5, and Andrew uh, pointed that out as he was reading the scriptures. So verse 18 is very important. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself. And he gave, through Christ, and he gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, but he has also then committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are then God's ambassadors. And so what do we learn from this verse 18? Well, let's look at it. There are three aspects from this verse that I'd like us to remember about reconciliation. First of all, God does the reconciling. Point number one, God does the reconciling. We don't do the reconciling. He does the reconciling, and we say, yes, I do. Okay? He takes the initiative because it says it is God from whom God who reconciles us. 
So he does the reconciling, and in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, we know it is by grace that we are saved, not through our own self and works, not through works, not through our own self. It is by grace. It is God's gift. So it's very evident in Scripture that he does the initiating of this reconciliation. He takes the first step. For God so loved the world. He takes the first step. Reconciliation is to God. Okay, reconciliation is to God. So we're heading toward him, we're facing him. He is the active one, and that causes the reconciliation. That relationship, it is with him, with him. Thirdly, the reconciliation is through a person, and that's Jesus Christ. So when we want to have reconciliation with God, we don't have a God that we can take around the neighborhood so he can see all that's happening around the neighborhood so he knows and sees. We have a God who sees and knows. We have a God who understands us, for he made us. Isn't it wonderful that he knit us together in our mother's womb? Isn't that cool? I was thinking about that today with, with Omar and Sharita as they have, uh, they're expecting twins, that God is knitting all them together, and uh, it's so beautiful. He's right there. We also pray for uh, Shalom and, uh, and uh, Michelle as they also await the birth of their, of their little one, and we thank God for their goodness and health that they have as well. And so um, God is reconciling. Um, he does the initiating. He does the work. The reconciling is to him. It is in the person of Christ. So reconciliation is God's plan of salvation. If we're not reconciled to God, then we have a sin barrier and we don't make it into heaven. So he is the way and he is the truth and he is the life. So reconciliation is God's plan of salvation and uh, it is the work of his grace. What is grace? Grace is uh, something that's not deserved. Grace is God's favor. Grace is God's goodness, God's blessing upon us. And so um, it is to be sought by us through faith. It is grace that he gives it to us, but it is faith and trusting in him that we make that circle complete. So when we have that reconciliation and there is nothing between us and the Lord, doesn't that bring joy? When you and I have someone in our neighborhood or in our family who we don't get along with and we, sit, we, we bury the hatchet and we decide this is how we're going to go on from here. It doesn't mean we go out and play golf every weekend, but it means that we are no longer at odds. We don't have to avoid one another. We can look into each other's eyes face to face and be really content that all is indeed well. And so it is acknowledged in praise and thanksgiving to God, which we will see in this uh, chapter as well. So what's the takeaway? You know, today we're going to have the dessert before the main course. How about that, eh? The takeaway is the lesson is having received God's grace, we can be very confident in God's promises that he's going to protect us. When we have God's grace and God's forgiveness, and Jacob experienced that, when he was wrestling with God, he had God's protection and God's um, provision and when he received his grace, called him by a different name, Jacob became Israel. We have this confidence now that uh, he will protect us when we try and reconcile with others. We don't have to be afraid anymore. The love that we have shown, we can stretch out and show others. And we'll see this in this chapter. So we can have confidence. So ask God's grace for God's grace so that we may then um, face those areas in our lives that we need to reconcile with others. So a quick outline of the chapter. So this chapter is 20 verses, and it begins, um, it begins with a, a statement that Jacob looked up, he lifted up his eyes, and what did he see? He saw Esau. You know, now Esau and him were hostile enemies, and Jacob ran away from Esau because Jacob had stolen his birthright and his blessing and he had done him wrong, and he and his mother decided, you better run. So he became a fugitive, and he ran to his uncle, <clears throat> Uncle Laban. So he's been away for 20 years. So how would you uh, feel if you were going to look and meet somebody in the eye who you, uh, who you hurt and who you deceived and who you stole from 20 years ago? It's probably still on both your minds. So he's pretty scared. So what, what's even more uh, uh, tough here is the fact that Esau has 400 men with him. Whoa, you know, you figure four eyes, you know, face to face, one on one, you can handle, you might handle, but one against 400, like, oh my goodness. 
And so that was quite anxious. So anyway, uh, he makes plans. And so we see in verses uh, 1 to 11 that the brothers come together. There is dialogue, which is good. Let's talk it out. Let's get it out on the table. And the dialogue is there. They come together, and then they decide to separate. And then the patriarch, Jacob, then settles down. He actually buys property, and uh, there is Sukkoth, which means shelters. So he makes shelters for his livestock. I guess he's grown so large and so abundant uh, in his blessings from God that uh, it's too difficult to move from place to place, so let's build some shelters and let's stay put. So the wanderings of the patriarchs of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob now comes to an end. They're back in the land of Canaan, and this is where they're going to stay at least for a little while until they go and have a trip to Egypt. And so I want to remind us where we are in the geography of this. So we have a map. As you can see, the red route is, um, is Jacob's route. So he comes from the top right there. He comes from the north. He comes from Padan Haram with his uncle Laban. And now he has his, uh, his two uh, maidservants, wives and two wives, four in all and his 12 children, and he's coming down there, and at Manayim, Mahanayim is where he saw the camp of God. He saw angels camping there, so he knew the presence of God, and then in Peniel is where he uh, wrestled with God that one night, and then you can see Sukkoth there in the middle. That's where he settled down. You see the river uh, Jacob, uh, Jabok comes in from the left side, uh, from the, yeah, from the right side there comes in, and then you have the River Jordan. The River Jordan is that blue uh, line that goes from the top of the page down to the bottom. And uh, you can see Shechem is over the hills, and it's on your, your left side of your picture. Though. So Shechem uh, will be an important um, city in our next chapter. There's something really, really, really sad that happens there, and uh, we'll talk about that next time. So it's a real place, and it's a real event. And uh, let's look at verses... Uh, um, 11 here, 1 to 11. And so we see here that um, the brothers come together, and um, so Jacob then divides up his children and, uh, with, you know, with his wives, um, Leah, Rachel, and his two female servants that are wives. And uh, then he puts the female servants and the children up front, and then Leah and her kids, and then Rachel and Joseph are in the rear. So he's a little bit afraid. So he lines up all his children and all his wives in the order of importance, okay? So if there's an attack, the least importance will get attacked first. Most precious one is, um, which is Joseph, yeah. Most precious one is Joseph and Rachel. So he leaves them right back close to himself. And so here we see favoritism in the family. And that'll be your problem because you know these 12 kids, um, boys, will become the 12 tribes of Israel. And remember that boys are going to oust Joseph and sell him as a slave. And so this favoritism in the family then causes all kinds of problems. And so we see here that, um, that Jacob lines them up. And you know what? You think, you think the kids won't know this? They know. The family knows. Because they can see the real uh, motivation behind it. But uh, as it turns out in verse 3, he himself then goes ahead. This is kind of unusual. I think he's going ahead of all his family now. There was a time when he was scared. He was left behind. He stayed behind. He prayed to God, and he, he spent the night wrestling with God. But now there seems to be a change of character. Although God called him Jacob, um, deceiver, now Israel, the one who strives with God, the one who rules with God. There seems to be a change in this situation anyway. I think he's in front of everybody now. And by tradition, he bows seven times. So he bows and he gets closer and he bows and he goes closer. And uh, seven times as he approaches his brother. But uh, So he's hesitant to come to his brother. He's trying to be as meek and as humble and as gracious as possible, hoping for the very best, but probably thinking the very worst. And I think we are sometimes like that too. When we have an encounter with someone who we need to reconcile something with, we're not in good terms, there is a hesitation as to how close we come. But we see in verse 4, and Andrew read, uh, read this with so much joy, and Esau ran. Like, you know, he's running, man. Like, I haven't seen my brother in ages. He's running. 
and uh, you to meet Jacob, and what does he do? He runs, and he meets him, and he embraces him, and then he puts his arms around him. He doesn't put his arms around him. He throws his arms around him, and then he, around his neck, and he kissed him, and they wept. Whoa. I can see this just a slow motion, right? It's like a sports announcer, you know. And they did this, and then they did this, and they did this, and so he ran, right? He ran, and then he he ran, and then he uh, he embraced them, and he, and he did. He threw his arms around, them. and you know what? Then they kissed each other, oh my! And then they both started to cry. What a wonderful, wonderful reconciliation. He was afraid of his own life, and so Jacob shows that, and uh, comes. So then, um, then of course there is the family. And, uh, and then Esau, in verse 9, uh, says to him, uh, what, about, what does it mean, all these flocks and herds? What about all these droves of animals that you sent? And so, you know, Jacob has to be careful with his answer. Why did he give him all those animals as gifts? Well, was it to bribe him? It could be. Maybe it was to uh, just give him a gift because it was tradition. Maybe it was uh, the fact that God had already abundant and blessed him, and he just wanted to share what he had. But nevertheless, we see here that um, he graciously said that it is God who has given me these things. These children God has graciously given me. So we see again the word grace. It was God's grace that showed upon me. And having received God's grace, we can know he will protect us as we reconcile with other people. And so um, down the list then, um, he introduces them all. And, uh, and then in verse 9, very interesting, is uh, Esau then uh, says to him, I already have plenty. He calls him my brother. Isn't it interesting? The enemy calls him my brother, but Jacob didn't ever call him his brother in this encounter. When we read the scriptures, it's really important that we read it as though we're reading it for the first time. And we've got, we have to look carefully to some of the details. So Esau calls him brother. Brother. It was interesting when I, uh, I did some missionary work and I was in Ed Edmonton and uh, I needed a haircut. So I went into this place and this guy says, hello, brother, welcome in. Come on in. He called me brother the whole time. He was Muslim of faith. But he called me brother. You know, you're my brother. Where are you from? Well, Ontario. Oh, good. You need a haircut. Come, let me give you, I'll give you a discount. You're doing God's work. Great. Wonderful. But, uh, you know, probably in that half hour that I was there, or 40 minutes, you know, he probably called me brother all the time. You know, and it was really interesting. So here he is. It was a welcoming thing for me to be welcomed as a brother. And so um, he calls him brother. But what does Jacob call Esau? Calls him Lord. And he refers to himself as his servant. Lord, Esau, you know, I gave them to you. You know, um, these are my servants. You know, I am your servant. Lord and servant. And so he's put himself in a place of humility. Um, so that's an interesting thing that we observe here. And so he then encourages him in verse 10. He said, uh, you know, I don't need anything. Um, no, please take it. Um, if I found favor in your eyes, this is a gift is a gift for me, and seeing you is like seeing the face of God. In other words, I saw the face of God the other day, and I was so thrilled. There's reconciliation. He's forgiven me, and I forgive you and all as well. Favor that we can share one with another. It is good to share the goodness of the Lord. And uh, so again, in verse 11, he encourages him to accept this gift. So as we can see in these 11 verses that Jacob's life um, is an example to us. God is able to bring about reconciliation. It's God who did this. It wasn't the gifts that Jacob had. It wasn't his prayer necessarily. But his prayer in the previous chapter was to uh, deliver me from my brother. Save me. And uh, so God answered his prayer. But the thing is this, that uh, reconciliation is a matter of God. God takes the initiative. It is his plan. It is his desire. And so we have to do what we can, but even though uh, we have weakness of faith, Jacob had weakness of faith. He was scared. He was anxious. He had some plans as to how he was going to go about it until he met God and he saw God's graciousness that he was able to wrestle with him and that God uh, allowed him to be victorious. And uh, from that wrestling, he saw God and he lived. So he'll see his brother and he'll live. 
his brother will not uh, bring to the end of his life. And so, again, God is able to bring about reconciliation even though we may show, show weakness of faith. We may not think it's possible, but um, God can bring that about. And I know each of us have stories in our lives where we reconciled and God brought about the reconciliation. The second thing that I wanted to uh, bring out uh, in the next verses from 12 to 17 is that the brothers now separate. They come together and they separate. And so we learn from his example here, instead of using deception, let us now make wise decisions. Let us make wise decisions in, uh, in, our, fo in our following after God's calling upon our lives. So Jacob, of course, means deceiver. And throughout this uh, passage, we see his name referred to as Jacob, 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 Jacob. Israel shows up, the last word in verse 20, where then Jacob um, builds an altar, and he says, this is the God of Israel. Israel as a nation doesn't exist yet. So he was saying, you are my God. Amen? You're my God. And so um, we can, instead of deception, so then he, um, he self says to him, you know, why don't I accompany you? Now that we, you know, bury the hatch and we're on good terms, why don't I accompany you? Uh, I'll protect you. Um, you know, you have a lot of animals and stuff. I got 400 men, so I'm an army, so let's protect you as we go, go home. Uh, Jacob then uh, in 13 says, well, my Lord knows. He calls him my Lord. You know that I've got kids and I've got animals that are nursing, so I'm going to be walking really slow. You've got 400 men. You're probably riding camels and horses, and you can move a lot faster. So why don't you just go ahead, and, uh, and I'll be all right. Um, verse 14, so let my Lord just go ahead of his servant. Again, you are my Lord. I'm your servant, and just move along and um, we'll be coming back a little bit later on. In the end of verse 14, you see that he makes a promise, until I come to my Lord in Seir. Where is Seir? Well, Seir is south. It's south. It's where Edom is. The nation of Edom will be there, and so that is where Esau goes. Esau, you might remember, uh, has red skin or red hair, so he is a rugged, outdoors kind of a guy, and Jacob is more of a home kind of a guy, more passive, not as aggressive and outgoing and domineering and taking initiative of everything. But Esau is that rough and tough guy, so he is that guy that uh, will be in the, uh, the desert there in Edom. So he becomes the father of the Edomites. And so Esau then uh, leaves, and, um, but Jacob says, I'll see you back in, in Seir, but he doesn't go there. He doesn't go there. He ends up in Sukkoth, as you can see, uh, later on in verse 18, Jacob then, um, Jacob, however, in verse 17, went to Sukkoth where he built a place for himself and he made shelters for his livestock. And that is why the place is called Sukkoth. So Sukkoth means shelters. So he now buys the land so we can see he wants to settle in and no more wandering all is well. He's reconciled with his uncle. He's reconciled with his brother. And now we can live in peace. We can live in peace and enjoy life. And so he doesn't go back to Zair. He doesn't go to Zair. And, um, and so I don't know, is he deceiving again his brother? Or does he just travel along and finds a good spot and says, I might as well settle down here instead of going further. And he settles. So um, having reconciled with his brother doesn't mean they have to live together in the same place. So, you know, there was a... Um, so when you... I was a gentleman in my own life. We had to reconcile. But, you know, I don't go play golfing with him every weekend. Right, he lives over here, and I live over there. I still my brother, still my friend, but he has a, goes on in his way, and I go on in my way. And so, reconciliation doesn't mean you have to be um, in each other's face and always uh, in each other's uh, neighborhood and that kind of thing. But you know that there's nothing between us anymore. And so, we learn here instead of being deceptive, you know, just do the wise thing and continue living. Um, and he buys the land and he settles in. And we can see here in verse 19 that uh, some names are mentioned. Shechem is the, um, is the place, the city, and uh, the founder of that place was Shechem. And Shechem had a son by the name, um, he bought us from the sons of Hamor. So Hamor, Hamor is the father, um, yeah, and the father of Shechem. Um, and we will see them in the next story where there is a, a father, father Hamer and son Shechem. 
and uh, we'll see a, a really bad situation happening in the next chapter. He settles in, and then he, for the first time we see in Jacob's life, for the first time in verse 20, he actually builds an altar. He actually now, first time is recorded that he's worshiping God. He builds an altar because uh, there is no temple to go to, no synagogue to go to, no tabernacle, no, no building. So he, he worships God where he's at, and he calls this place El El Elohi Israel. So he is the God of Israel, and uh, again, his name is Israel. So he is his God. So we can see here that uh, whatever guilt and fears that Jacob had, and however he tried to make reconciliation with his brother Esau, at the end he had to acknowledge that it was God who brought the reconciliation. It was God who brings peace and harmony back into his own family relationships and other relationships, and so he worships God. What do we consider today? Well, worth considering today is the fact that, um, that Jesus tells us the same. Reconcile. Okay? That's what he does. So when we see in Matthew 5, which is the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, if you are here worshiping, and you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, then you got to leave your gift here. you got to interrupt your worship, and you got to settle the matter first on a horizontal level before you can settle it on a vertical level. So leave it, and then remember your brother and sister has something against you. Leave your gift here in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift to me. So God has given us a responsibility. He's the God of reconciliation. He's reconciled himself with us, and he wants us to reconcile ourselves with each other. And that is the command of the Lord. Notice it says here, don't wait for the one who you've hurt to come to you. Don't say it's his fault. He needs to apologize first. No, 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 no. It says right here, you go first. So you open the door, and you ask the question, how have I offended you, and how I can make restitution? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're the God of reconciliation. You're the God who restores our relationship, our broken relationship with you. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that that agent, that person of reconciliation is Jesus. That Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose again on the third day that we might have life, forgiveness and life. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for our family and our friends. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you show yourself in the world by your design, the beautiful colors and the changes and the seasons, yet you change not. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we thank you that you're that anchor and that rock that we can build our lives on. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for our family and friends, and there are times we acknowledge that we're not able to talk to one another. Although we're related, we're not in fellowship. Although we're related, we're not talking, and um, there's animosity and hostility and hatred sometimes. We just pray, Heavenly Father, that you would show us clearly yourself in the circumstances that pertain to us, that you will speak to us individually, and where there is something to be done, help us to be obedient and help us to trust you that having experienced your grace, you will also give that grace to both parties so that it might move from a state of hostility to a state of harmony and peace. And as we conclude this morning, Lord, we pray for your people, Israel. We stand with them and we ask, oh God, that you would uh, be their God, that you would watch over them, that you would guide, give wisdom to those who are negotiating for peace protect those that are in, in warfare. We pray for those civilians that are in harm's way. And we pray, oh God, that you would be sovereign, take control. We do not know how to pray, but we pray for peace as you have commanded us to do in your word. And we pray um, lovingly and we pray free, frequently. We pray that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In your name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen.